This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Today. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. Yeah. I, you know, I, I figured this one we had to be extra professional. So, yeah, because we've, uh, we're bringing in a journalist to talk about his journalism. Right. This isn't your, you know, Sunday church picnic podcast anymore. That's right. So before we get too far into it, let's introduce the show. This All is right. the Wedge Live podcast. I'm John Edwards, your host, and my co-host today is Jason Garcia. Thank you for having me once again. Thanks for coming back. I always feel better after talking to you. Um, I know we we had a little bit of an embrace, a physical embrace on, uh, sat, was it Saturday? Yeah, at, at the Wedge Live family reunion. Yeah, we expressed our love for one another. Yeah, we watched good. your adoring fans compete in tests of strength and skill for your amusement. Yeah, giant Jenga. Yeah. And we, you know, brought strangers together to talk about local politics and other things that annoy them. And what do I what I appreciate about you Jason as a co-host is that you think you make sure I don't forget the stuff that I'm going to forget. I've noticed that about you. You're like, "Hey, didn't you want to talk about this?" <clears throat> and I remember because Jason reminded me that I did want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I try not to throw you under the bus, but you know, with with doing remote podcasting, sometimes it, you know, it can be a lot to try to keep track of everything. So, you know, I appreciate that you let me come on and share my thoughts, but also, you know, that I think together we make a pretty good team at helping this whole thing run smoothly. We do. We do. Yesterday was the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder by four Minneapolis police officers. Uh, has anything changed, Jason, in the last year in response to uh, that? I mean, there have been some minor changes enacted by our city government. Um, we haven't necessarily been told exactly what they are but we're being assured that they're there. I think, you know, the biggest change is just people are more engaged now. People are more aware and paying more attention, um, which is a tragedy that, you know, this has happened so many times just in the time that I've lived in Minneapolis and you've lived in Minneapolis, but it really took something so egregious to focus everyone on it. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if it had not happened during the pandemic with people, you know, locked away watching their their various screens, would the reaction have been the same or would it have just been another one, another name that we don't necessarily forget but that we move on from and don't have this this conversation that we've had over the last year. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, I think. You know, we are in an age where media is, you know, it's everywhere and it's everyone to an extent. So having viral videos of somebody being murdered by police officers in the street that, you know, was available basically as soon as it happened really changed the course of how this was addressed. And to your point, with everybody you know, being at home kind of at the end of a holiday weekend and having it happen just at such a time when everybody seemingly was paying attention, it really did change that narrative. Yeah, and I've I've been frustrated lately about police politics. Not lately, like all the time I'm frustrated about police politics because we're in this cycle of conversation that doesn't feel related to why we're here or how we got here. And when I think about the state of the Minneapolis police department, and if you're, if you're a person who thinks that the surge in violence, which is happening across the country right now, but if you're right. the kind of person who says, well, it's, it's all about 
how the police have been under-resourced. The state of the Minneapolis Police Department right now, the reason it's in a shambles, the reason it has disintegrated, basically, in the wake of last year, is all attributable to things they have done. They are responsible. The city council has not deprived the mayor or the chief of resources. Basically, a bunch of cops decided they didn't want to do the job anymore. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, and even I would say that, you know, having been caught doing something so terrible as murdering a citizen in the street didn't make the Minneapolis Police Department any more introspective or thoughtful about how they relate to the community or how they operate within the community. If anything, the reaction to that made them more intransigent and even more committed to wielding their power um, in ways that are, you know, clearly unjust. You know, I mean, since George Floyd was killed, um, Dolal Eid was killed um, in the city of Minneapolis at a busy gas station. Um, Officer Tony Partika has been um, revealed as possibly having fabricated confidential informants to arrest people, um, which resulted in someone else being brutalized. Like these are things that really shine a light on the operations and how MPD chooses to quote unquote enforce the law in the city of Minneapolis. And then they're acting as though people's reactions to, to their actions are somehow a reflection of not being funded properly, which is ridiculous. Yeah. You know, maybe the best representation of that, you know, we don't need reform attitude. We need more police is Paul Gasalka, who, did you see that video? He's out there attacking, attacking Minneapolis, which uh, is what a Republican state legislator is supposed to do in Minnesota, attack Minneapolis. The police of Minneapolis said, we need 400 more police to really make Minneapolis safe. Well, what happened? Well, the death of George Floyd happened months and months after that, and now we have many less police than we had then. So what's the solution? More police. It's not reforming police right now. That should not be the message. It's get the police out on the streets. Everybody cheer them on as they take back our streets. Right. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in most states, that's how it works. If you are a Republican legislator, you have to uh, demonize and vilify the people who live in the cities. Um, you know, a, a long time ago, somebody told me that nothing burns more than having to rely on people that you hate or fear. And certainly with the Twin Cities being the economic engine of the whole state, you know, the there are a lot of Republicans out state who resent Minneapolis for, you know, what they perceive as it being this liberal Sodom and Gomorrah, but they also are aware that without the Twin Cities, there would be no economy. I don't know if they're aware of that, Jason. I don't, <laughs> I don't think they're aware of that. Fair enough. Maybe that's me hearkening back to an older, older time in, in state politics when it took more um, political savvy and less demagoguery to, to maintain a position. And so, you know, we're in a place where we're, we're kind of blaming the community's reaction to the police for the state of uh, crime and safety right. in Minneapolis. If you'd been nicer to the police in the wake of them killing George Floyd, we wouldn't be here. Exactly. Um, you know, if, if only people wouldn't have been so upset at police misusing their power and, um, you know, using their resources to harm black and native and brown people, then everything would just be fine. Um, and I do think that, you know, that does speak to the, a segment of the population's desire to just sweep these things under the rug because 
they themselves don't feel threatened at all by police. So, you know, their solution is always going to be more police will make me feel safe and secure and comfortable. So that's mm-hmm. what solution everyone needs. And if you're Paul Gazelka, you represent the area where Minneapolis police, the kind of area where Minneapolis police come from. That's where we hire them from right. way far out. And you don't have a whole lot of the people, people of color, black, indigenous, brown people who are abused, often abused by the police. Right. So, so it's easy to say. You know, I'm explaining yeah. Republican politics to you, Jason. It's easy to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's easy to say we don't, we don't need reform. We need more police. Hire more of my residents to come into downtown uh, and abuse some of your your residents. Right. Yeah. If you can just export more of your tax dollars to other counties and other municipalities, it will uh, just solve more of the problems. Is anything else happening, Jason, you want to talk about before our guest arrives? Um, you know, I... I suppose I should make one um, announcement, I suppose. Um, I did, in anticipation of this podcast, reach out to uh, Mayor Fry and his um, chief of communication, as well as council member Alondra Cano, to ask if they had any comments that they wanted to make. That's very journalistic of you, Jason, reaching out for a comment. You want to be fair. Yeah, I I wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to to say something on the record, um, since we're going to be talking about their actions and things like that. But neither of them responded. Um, I I contacted them both via their city email as well as their personal cell phones. So um, I think it's you know they've had an opportunity to respond and they elected not to do it. I think the mayor's office gave a comment in the article, right? Yeah, um, nothing very specific, it didn't seem. And I'll save most of this for when Logan Carroll gets here, but I mean, the mayor working with his political allies, collaborating with them, doesn't seem that big a de- like that big a deal to me. Like, of course, we've got politics happening in our politics, but <laughs> like the chief being so deeply involved in it as he is seems wrong and new and different. Yeah, I, you know, I think... Certainly, these astroturf quote unquote community groups are nothing new, um, and they happen at every level of our politics. But I think, especially when you look at who is involved um, in this particular group, certainly raises a lot of questions about conflict of interest and, you know, how people are using their positions in non-elected board boards um, and things like that to influence city politics in ways that, you know, maybe aren't the most ethical. And I wonder if the article has either has made it more clear or less clear that there's a difference between Operation Safety Net and Operation Safety Now. What do you think? Um, I, th- I would hope that people have started to pick up the difference just because Operation Safety Net is is not currently a thing. Um, oh, did they disband, or will they be coming back later? Um, I imagine that they'll be coming back in some form when the other officers go on trial later this year. Um, but for right now, you know, we're not seeing the National Guard presence and um, the increased um, state patrol presence and things like that. It makes you wonder if Bill Rodriguez was also advising the governor on communications. Like, I've got a cool name for you. <laughs> Operation Safety Now, just with a net. Yeah. You know, I think it's, um, it really does raise a lot of questions about how much influence uh, this one person has had over the sort of branding and marketing of Jacob Fry's policing strategy i would hope not much because he just he seems like an over exuberant yahoo this bill rodriguez guy he asked the first question at a wedge neighborhood meeting the lowry hill east neighborhood association there was a 
last October, mm-hmm. there was a crime and safety uh, meeting hosted by now city council candidate Alicia Gibson, uh, who at the time was the neighborhood president, neighborhood org president. And inexplicably, uh, Bill Rodriguez got to ask the first question. Even though it mm. appears now he does not even live, let alone in the wedge, doesn't even live in Minneapolis. Yeah, uh, you know, I maybe they can call that the wedge live rule, where you know if you make the effort to go someplace to a completely different neighborhood, they'll just like let you ask the first question. Logan is having technical difficulties, but he's on the way. Oh, okay. So. We're going to have to stretch. <laughs> All right. Well, we're just fortunately, cut out. We, we can cut out the bullshit <laughs> in, in post production. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a live podcast. That's true. Um, yeah. So, how did the rest of the uh, family reunion go? Was there a, a big family photo taken and things like that? No, no photos. Uh, I just never suggest it. Yeah. It gives it that uh, secret secret VIP <laughs> party kind of vibe. There are no photos of this ever happening. Well, that's good. And, you know, if there were photos, Carol would identify each each person in the photo and, you know, try to trademark whatever's important to them. Yeah. I mean, there were a few times where I felt like it was important to kind of peek beyond the fence and make sure she wasn't lurking out there yeah. listening has to... She, uh... Has she ever come after you? Because I know you poke at her on... Uh... <laughs> On Minneapolis's favorite local politics internet forum, eDemocracy. Um, no, she has never come at me. I just I don't think that she I don't know, has the capacity to Google search someone with a name as common as mine, I guess. I don't know. Um I mean, I've got I've got a pretty common name too. She found yeah. me. Well, I I could argue that you found her. Um but uh, yeah, we, she, we found each other. That's how it worked. Yes. We found each other. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, she's definitely responded to some things that I've posted. Um, you know, calling you a um, lobbying firm or yeah. insisting that what you do doesn't rise to the level of being called journalism. Yeah, you you kick up the dirt. You make you make a mess, and the the blowback always comes at me. I know. That's why it's so much fun for me. <laughs> I I have kind of wondered if she has thought that, like, perhaps I'm just a sock puppet account that you've created. Yeah. Is Jason Garcia real? Exactly. Are you CGI? That's another thing. You remember the Latricia Vital meeting with landlords? I posted the video from that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's people, uh, defenders of hers, uh, one of them attacking me as if like like i didn't cgi that video she really said those things i'm the expert at so politics is really a popularity contest right like i'm the expert at getting ready putting my lipstick on curling my hair and selling our message you all are the experts at giving me what i'm selling that's part of you know when you're presented with something that you can't argue directly you have to find creative ways to um try to nullify the argument and you know saying oh there should be an investigation by the attorney general into wedge lives funding yeah in re- in response to you pointing out that latricia has said that she's basically going to shill for the landlords um I, I'm not sure what the the point of that argument is. I even I even pointed out in one of the tweets I was very fair. Like Latricia didn't mean that you should punish your tenants for not voting for her. She was joking about punishing your tenants <laughs> for, not, for not voting for her, which is a hilarious joke. Anyone you know in the ward, please ask them to sign up and become a delegate for me. The deadline is this coming Friday uh, for delegates. Somebody said they had tenants. Demand that they become a delegate for me or the lease will be terminated. No. <laughs> right. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that 
many renters find that the concept to be hilarious. Yeah. You take a real life tragedy involving someone with lots of power, punishing someone with no power and you make a joke out of it. Yeah. I mean, that's how comedy works. We know exactly. comedy. Exactly. Yeah. Punching down has always been the hallmark of a great comedian. Exactly. Yeah. I I found it interesting that um speaking of the attorney general that he actually you know was promoting your material no that was surprising the state attorney general keith ellison yeah i think he likes philippe cunningham i'm I'm guessing there's some kind of coordination going there going on there they like each other for some reason yeah i mean i've been around politics (laughs) (laughs) although keith keith ellison endorsed mayor fry you got a little blowback for that now he's He's probably endorsed uh, Cunningham, right? Um, I don't know. I haven't. I don't think I've seen it, him endorsing any of the CMs yet. Yeah, because I, I don't think you would tweet those things if you weren't right. Wasn't meant in support of Cunningham. Yeah, I think maybe that's one of the leaning neutral ways to <laughs> support Cunningham. Maybe I'll write an expose exposing uh, Keith Ellison for supporting Philippe Cunningham. Yeah, and then you can do a follow-up on him supporting Jeremiah. Right, yeah. Same name? Yeah. What's that about? (laughs) What's the connection? Yes. Is there some sort of collusion going on here? And here's something you'll be sad about, Jason, as we continue to stretch waiting for our guests. Uh. Victor Martinez, what's going on there? I saw some uh, early results from the DFL endorsement process that Victor Martinez was ahead of uh, Jeremiah Ellison in Ward 5. Yeah, I I mean, I can't speak to that. I've been, you know, I I haven't been as um, inquisitive and investigative as you have as far as getting those early results. So I can't really say what's going on there. Yeah, the early results. We have no idea what's really happening, but I was surprised to see Ellison, at least at the time that I saw that, uh, behind in the delegate count. Yeah. I mean, we'll see how everything shakes out. Um, Hopefully, we'll start hearing some results soon. Yeah, coming up, people will start getting their ballots. Are you a delegate, Jason? I am not, no. How did that happen? You tried, right? Well, you see, John, um, here we we can break some news. I'm in the process of, uh, oh, did something just happen here? Okay, Jason, I know you're in the middle of a story, but our guest has arrived. So do you even remember what the story you were telling was? I honestly don't. Okay. Well, it wasn't important. We're going to move on to our guest. Our guest is Logan Carroll, who is... Well, he's a lot of things. He just wrote a story in the Minnesota Reformer about Operation Safety Now uh, and their coordination with the mayor and the chief. And he also hosts a podcast on fascism. Do I have that uh, right? It's, uh, the, the, the guy who put together the, the Patreon page did not do a great job. So that's not quite right. It's uh, just to look at the modern right in America, the right in America. Okay. okay. Including fascism. Okay. I was close. I was close. (laughs) So let's get to talking about your story in the Minnesota Reformer. My first question as someone who has done a few data requests is why did you do the data request? Did something tip you (laughs) off? Yeah. uh, So this all started back in December, shortly after the budget vote, um, when the, uh, you know, they voted to on the Minneapolis 2021 budget, the city council did. And I got a tip from, it got passed along to me through Patrick Kulikan at the Reformer that Operation Safety Now might be an AstroTurf group. Um, my, f- main, my main focus, um, I've branched out a little bit in the last few months, but especially back then, my main focus was like online misinformation and disinformation. Um, and at the same time, there was this pretty, uh, the, 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 this good friend of mine who's like a, a lefty who, uh, is working on the Robin Woosley campaign and they were posting stuff 
about operation safety now looking like an AstroTurf group. So I was, I was getting this tip from two very different directions um, at the same time. So I took a day, I read about them and yeah, there were, there's some initial red flags. Uh, you know, you got your Bill Rodriguez, his, uh, his job, he's like the main name attached to it. And he's a PR consultant. Um, and I was trying to figure out who, who might be some of the people, if it was an AstroSurf group, um, who might be some of the people behind it. So <laughs> I went to their website and I was reading their talking points. And I remember thinking to myself, these sound like they were written by a cop. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really expect right. much. I thought they must have talked to Arredondo or somebody at his office um, and gotten a little bit of input. I wonder if there are any names in emails. Um, Cause that was, that was 100% my focus at that point. And so I did this very intentionally broad data request. Um, I threw in the mayor just cause he's politically aligned on this issue um, and asking for emails to or from these email addresses that are associated with operation safety now. And I completely forgot about it. And then a few months later, um, I just, in my inbox, got uh, a PDF document from the city that had almost 900 pages of emails. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, <laughs> and how, how long did it take you to get through those? Uh, you know, um, I'm, I, I'm going to brag here. This is actually one of my, this is something I'm really good at is reading giant, boring documents. So. <laughs> It's not something that helps me out often in life, okay. but it came in handy in this instance. So, yeah, so I just started reading through it. Uh, it was in no particular order. Uh, take a notes. One of the things that's it's, it's a real shame. I printed it all off. It's a great prop. It's a shame we don't have the video because I got like uh, this huge stack of papers with all my little post-it notes sticking out the side. It looks pretty cool. Makes me look like I'm look look like I know what I'm doing. It is kind of painful to read those really long PDFs. I can't say that I've ever printed out a 900 well, page PDF. As someone who used to work in printing, I can tell you that even printing a 900 page PDF isn't a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> you know, printed double sided, I mean, that's basically a ream of paper. <laughs> oh, I did four pages to a page. Mm. Uh, it's tiny. It's tiny. And oh, snuck wow. into my wife's office and used their very nice printer. It was done in about twenty minutes. It was just yeah. that sounds even <laughs> more painful. Four four email pages to a to a yeah, page. Well, but I had noticed some of the same things when you're talking about like talking points coming from the mayor and the chief and like these these various groups. Like it felt coordinated. I know the mayor was using a phrase, "Our city is bleeding," and then the people who are suing the city held a press conference. They use the same phrase, our city is bleeding. Mm -hmm. Both end pops like, up a lot. The, yeah. Yeah. Like there's, it's been illuminating to have more of that confirmed that, you know, who's coordinating with who, that kind of thing. So let's start with what, what operation safety now is. It's not the multi-jurisdictional military and law enforcement operation called operation safety net. Let's get that out of the way. Uh, they've they've also endorsed candidates in the Star Tribune. Talk about another conservative connection there. Like, how do you get your endorsements printed by the Star Tribune? Right. Um, and so the machinery of conservative Minneapolis is gearing up for this election year. And a big theme is crime and safety. Uh, Jason, help me understand what question I'm asking here. Um. So there are just a lot of, so, you know, as you noted here earlier, uh, some of the talking points really sound like they were written by police. Um, and one of the people who is mentioned in your article um, is Lisa Clemens. Mm -hmm. um, she's um, listed as being part of the leadership of Operation Safety Now. Um, she is the founder and director of A Mother's Love, mm -hmm. which was contracted by the city of Minneapolis um, to do outreaches, part of Operation Safety Net. Um, and this is where, you know, making that distinction is kind of important. Um, but Operation um, Safety Net and other things have resulted in A Mother's Love being um, 
contracted with the city for at least a hundred thousand dollars uh just from mpd without competitive um requests for proposals or anything like that and she happens to be a retired Mm -hmm. cop um so that's kind of one of those associations that jumped out at me um that's an when that's you were, a phenomenal connection. That was a piece of info that um, I wanted when I was writing this, and I just didn't have the time to look for it. So that's amazing. Yeah, you know, and I think that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you. Like, you know, do you, you know, John and I both kind of poke around a lot in local politics and sort of see the same people participating. Is this an area that was kind of new to you, <laughs> or is this were there certain people that you were specifically looking for because you? had heard them before. No, this was all new to me. Um, I, through, you know, my previous life, I did strategic research for um, environmental labor and social justice nonprofits. So I had one or two connections um, with uh, with the city council member and, and a few other ones were like very gra- gracious and talked to me. And, and I just told them straight out, like, I, I'm not a city politics guy. I have no clue what's going on. Can you please help me? I don't even know the questions to ask. <laughs> And uh, several of the city council members were like very, very helpful. Um, a handful of them spoke to me um, from both sides of this issue were very helpful um, and uh, really helped me get up to speed. And yeah, no, man, I, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's maybe go back to what Operation Safety Now is. It's a website, it's a Facebook page, they've made candidate endorsements, maybe just a brief explanation of what it is. Well, it, it doesn't really exist. Um, this is what you just said. It's a Facebook page, it's a website. That's it. Um, they claim to be, or have claimed in the past, to be a community group representing uh, concerned Minneapolis residents. And um, before we get into it, there's there's this really interesting little, important little nuance here. And that is that there are, I think it's worth saying that there are a lot of people in Minneapolis who are like very concerned about crime. Um, and rightly so. I spoke to one woman uh, who's a member of Operation Safety Now, a founding member of Operation Safety Now, who you know, had bullets come through her living room wall. Like she wanted to advocate for more funding for the M- MPD and Operation Safety Now helped her do that. Um, and in that regard, they really do fill the same role as community groups do. But, but they're not. They, you know, as it notes in the article, they have no member meetings They have no organizational structure. They are not an incorporated nonprofit. They have no leadership except for Bill Rodriguez. Um, You know, I spoke to this this woman who's a member, and uh, she was unable to answer, like, basic questions about the group um, and told me things that were, like, contradictory. I think one of the things that... uh, really leapt out at me from that conversation is, you know, I was, I was speaking to council member Andrew Johnson and I asked him like, who is it? What is your understanding of who operation safety now is? And he told me, well, they're like business people. They're very, they're very corporate was his exact word. They're very corporate. And then I was talking to this Karen Forbes and I said, you know, do you have an organizational structure? And she said, no, we are not corporate like that. I mean, so did did Andrew Johnson say what gave him that impression? Just his interactions with people who represent the OSN? Yeah, he just he just meant that they were like downtown professional types. Not necessarily. I specifically asked him, like, do you mean it's like the downtown council? Do you mean it's like corporate interests? And he said, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, they're people who have a very corporate approach to how they're going to structure their political work. Um. And that's sort of a framework. So, yeah, Operation Safety Now doesn't have uh, member meetings, not an incorporated nonprofit, and uh, has no organizational structure to speak of. Yeah, this woman that I spoke to is identified as a founding member, uh, and she said she didn't know what that meant. I spoke to another gentleman who said he was a founding member who said, 
I spoke to him by Facebook and he told me, um, I was a member when it was founded, but I'm not a founder per se. Um, so it really doesn't exist except as a Facebook page <laughs> and a website and Bill Rodriguez's activism. Um, and there's, there's a number of groups mm -hmm. like this popping up. Is Minneapolis Voices new for this year? Is that a new group? Yes. Uh, it was incorporated in November. And there's, there's one, you know, this, this story went through so many drafts. I, I lose track even of like, like what information made it into the last draft. So I don't know. I can't remember if this was in what was printed or not, but MPLS Voices, unlike Operation Safety Now, is an incorporated nonprofit um, and they are tax exempt. And they have identified leaders. I don't know what their organizational structure is, but, but they have identified leaders um, in these emails. And they also, <laughs> there's... Um, a line in one of the emails from uh, Bill Rodriguez's collaborator on this project, Eric Wan. Uh, let me let me see if I can pull it up for you really quick. Yeah. So this is Eric Wan. He's writing to a group of people who are involved behind the scenes, some of whom are involved in operate or are involved in MPLS voices and some people who aren't. Um, but he says this, and he's talking about MPLS voices, Minneapolis voices. There's active fundraising going on in that group. And we've hired a very successful full-time fundraiser to solicit funds from philanthropies, businesses, individuals, and under and other funding sources. So and there's another email where he's writing to Council Vice President Andrew Jenkins, and he describes Operation Safety, or he describes M Minneapolis Voices as, quote, the umbrella under which Operation Safety Now works. <laughs> I can, it's, it's, it, and so it's suspiciously convoluted. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, when, yeah. when we're talking about fundraising and where the money is coming from, Operation Safety Now is engaging in. I don't know what looks like a political campaign to me uh, in support of the mayor, in support of more police. They're, I mean, it seems like their, their existence is about, you know, affecting the outcome of the 2021 election. So, yes, I, I mean, I, I don't think they're registered as a PAC or anything. I know you touched on some of the lobbying yeah. None of their members are registered as lobbyists. Yeah. You know, I reached out to somebody with the Minneapolis Campaign Finance Board just for some guidance about, like, what does any of this mean? And uh, they, I didn't hear back from them. Um, so w when it comes to that side of things, I, I want to be, like, really clear that I am not accusing anyone of any violation. Um, I, I just simply don't know the law well enough to comment on sure. whether they should be or shouldn't be. And I don't know their structure. I mean, like it, MPLS voices is like a registered tax exempt nonprofit. Like it's entirely possible that they filed the paperwork in that name. And that's, you know, again, operation safety now doesn't really exist except Bill Rodriguez's activism. There's also a group called like Minneapolis together or together Minneapolis. When you start like yeah. following and you click through some of these websites and like there's a list of these organizations support Minneapolis together. Um, and it's like all the same people yeah. a part of each or a part of each organization. You've got the downtown council, you've got other kind of conservative elements in Minneapolis politics. It's a lot of groups springing up and I'm, I mean, the reason I'm curious about the campaign aspect is because we had, we had a, basically a downtown council and business community sponsored PAC in 2017 that spent close to $300,000 trying to impact the city council race that year. It was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what form that will take this year. 
it feels like Operation Safety Now is at least a part of the effort by conservative Minneapolis to affect the 2021 election. Can, can I just say, I really appreciate that description. Um, conservative Minneapolis. That's... <laughs> yeah. People don't believe that there's a conservative and a progressive Minneapolis. We're all blue. That's what Lisa Goodman said in 2021. Or no, that's what John Tevlin said about Lisa Goodman in 2021. She's a nice hue of blue. And you, you got a, a quote from Lisa Goodman saying, you know, both sides do it. How is this different from, you know, reclaim the block? I mean, is it, is it different? I, you know, as, as critical as I am of uh, conservatives and people involved with Operation Safety Now, like I get the impression they all sincerely believe in what they're selling. So is it, is it all that different? I, I have not looked into Reclaim the Block extensively. Um, I've, I am friendly with some people who are uh, involved with it. Um, but I, I would just make this point that like there has been an awful lot made about the very large donation that the Open Societies Foundation made to impact this issue. Um, and when you look at it, it that's a, a, a great example to say that it's happening on both sides. But we know who that donation came from. We know who it went to. There is a list, a coalition website for um, the group that's like leading that campaign that received that donation that lists all the member organizations. Most of those member organizations have websites where they list their board of directors and their staff. I mean, there's, there's a very clear difference just in terms of transparency. And that is important and that does matter. Yeah. I, one of the things that, you know, in reading this article that Logan put together that really stood out to me as far as, you know, I'm obviously very aware that AstroTurf groups exist. They've been, they've, been a part of politics for a long time, um, you know, and certainly Minneapolis politics are no different. But when you look at some of the names that are involved is another area that I think makes this seem so different. Um, you know, you have former city council people as operating as part of this group. You have um, people who are currently running for city council. Mm -hmm involved with this group. You have um, people who are on non-elected boards within the city who are part of this group. Um, and I think that to me makes it a, a different sort of experience, um, regardless of what Lisa Goodman would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is... Part of the question too, I think um, one other way that it's different uh, that is also very worth highlighting is that, you know, my wife runs a community organization. She runs uh, Inkalinix Unidix. It's the tenants' rights organization that sued that landlord, Steve Friends. Um, yes. Yeah, that's my wife's org. So I, I sort of have like one eye on that world and, and a, 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 for somebody who's really not involved in it, a, a really high level of, like, I see it a lot. Um, and there's a way that this operates, <laughs> these sorts of group operates, which is where the community group goes to the elected official or goes to the head of the department and says, this is what our members one or like this is you know we've done x y and z research and we think this is best and then they the elected official or the uh department head whoever it is works with them and says like okay and then they, they work on that they collaborate maybe but but there's a there's a direction that the activism flows and it flows from the community group to the official and with Operation Safety Now, at least in some instances, you've got an inversion of that, where you've got Arredondo. I mean, I don't, I don't know that he personally reviewed it, but a 
the the chief financial officer for the Minneapolis Department uh, Police Department forwarded him to personally review language for the Operation Safety Now website. There is a agenda included in this packet of emails for a meeting that Bill Rodriguez and this Eric Juan had with Arredondo. And one of the points is our reform position, and then in parentheses, for review, which I don't know what that means. I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds like the community group, quote unquote, is coming to the department head, coming to the mayor, because they also sent the mayor's office uh, language for the, uh, for their communications uh, to, be, to review, and asking them, what do we support? What is our reform yeah. position? And that's, like right. I said, an inversion of the way I understand that this these sorts of relationships normally work. Yeah, so one of the things I tweeted when your article came out and I read it, was uh, that you left something out of the story. I think I got that wrong. I know. It was in the story. <laughs> I know. But, but the way it was described was almost tame compared to like my reaction reading the email because it's it's about like sending the chief the questions in advance, doing rehearsals, mm. multiple takes. Yeah. And like, and then calling it an interview. <laughs> and I and I went and I saw the video on on Facebook labeled an interview. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think anyone watching it realizes this is a, this is a friendly conversation, but it's, it's basically a political ad that the chief is knowingly collaborating on this with this group yeah. on. So that, that was one of the, the parts of the article mm -hmm. uh, really stood out to me. Sorry for saying you left it out. You didn't leave it out, but I think you undersold it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, know, were, you were too easy. Working with them. the with the the budget isn't is a sort of the the reader's attention span. You know, we only got so much of that, so we had to cut a lot. I, I found it very. I found that email very compelling. There's was... there's something else, another detail that is not included in that email, but like when you look at the totality of it, and I'm. You know, I am proud of the of the the degree to which I went through these. Um, something you learn is that Arredondo recorded that video, and then had like back to back. He had that meeting with Bill Rodriguez, where he recorded that, and then he had a meeting with the leadership of Operation Safety Now, which really stands out to me that it's like he's a head of department who's too busy to talk to the city council members. He's supposed to be working with, presumably. Yeah. But he's meeting with this group back to back. And the, the turnaround <laughs> time, when you talk about some of the MPD staff working on these this data to get yeah. back to yeah. Operation Safety Now's request, they're getting back to them with all this stuff. And you describe how it, it's taking the chief and multiple people within MPD to like sign off on it and they're getting back to them within a day. Uh -huh. and, I, and I have, all, you know, you also hear the city council complaining how, and Lisa Bender's quoted in the article saying they're not all that responsive to council members and they're getting back to this group within a day. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, that's something that again, kind of, highlights what makes this a little different is you know the the participation of the police chief mm -hmm. um and the resources that mpd is putting toward it um and obviously you know it's in their interest to find allies that are going to make them look as good as possible given yeah. all of the things that have happened over the past year that have really caused community trust to you know just collapse around them. But at the same time, that's something that is a concern that, you know, the that MPD has groups that are out there basically doing propaganda for them. And you've got you've got the Minneapolis eight. Is that how we're referring to them? The group that's suing the city I just, uh... over the that's how they were referred yeah. to in 
in the media, but in like numerous news articles. So I was like, yeah, that's convenient shorthand. <laughs> Makes them yeah. sound like a group of Spider-Man villains. Yeah, I'll use that. Right. <laughs> so Don Samuels, Sondra Samuels, Kathy Spann, who is a city council candidate running Ward 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, this group of people suing the city over the charter provision and the minimum number of police mm-hmm. saying that Minneapolis has not maintained a police force of the size to comply with that charter provision. Mm-hmm. There's some crossover with operation safety. Now there, I also have the impression that that lawsuit is simply about getting headlines in local TV news and print news stories. That's what it feels like to me. Well, they've been very successful at that. <laughs> yeah. It feels less like a lawsuit than part of a PR campaign. Yeah, and one thing that I want to point out with that is that's not like this. This group of people are successful not just in local media. Um, you know, mm-hmm. there are articles in Time Magazine about the Minneapolis Eight. Um, Bill Rodriguez um, and other members of Operation Safety Now have been quoted many times in national media as well as international media. Mm -hmm. Um, So this isn't just like, you know, your, your neighborhood organization that's putting out a newsletter and happens to get quoted in the star tribune or something like that. Like these are, this is a well-organized effort to make this um, pushback against, you know, the concept of, broad change to the police department um, seem incredibly unpopular Mm -hmm. and seem like there are a lot more people against it and kind of stoke those fears um, and reinforce those fears Yeah, um, that's going on. But yeah. So we were talking about uh, Operation Safety Now and what it is and what it isn't. And one of the things that occurs to me is that you know, Bill Rodriguez was not organizing people around any sort of a political agenda. Not really. I mean, he the, one developed over time. He was just organizing people to be afraid. Um, and and like you said, in international media, the one that blew me away is he's got like a profile in the French language Paris-based La Parisienne newspaper. Which, like, as you said, like that's not just a community group, or, or maybe maybe they're just a very, who knows? Maybe the stars lined up for that one. I don't know. Is the, is the that a like a conservative French outlet? I'm just wondering where how they were approaching the story. You know, I I was nearly fluent in French after three years in high school, and that was like 17 years ago. So. I think what happens when people from outside Minneapolis cover Minneapolis, they basically got the story written and they're looking for people to fill in the quotes. Mm-hmm. And so if it's a, if you're coming at it from a, you know, the community is crying out for more police perspective, you find the group that contains those people and you say, Hey, who can I talk to that will give me what I need for my story? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the the media criticism aspect of the story was pretty important to me that there, I think are numerous failures and, you know, some of at least one of the reporters who wrote about operation safety now in a way that I felt was uncritical is someone who I have a lot of respect for and admire. So like, I don't think there's like, I'm not alleging any sort of a grand conspiracy. I think that there were just a host of failures by the media in this saga. Yeah. And it's not so much like giving time to operation safety now and their perspective, like in a way it's useful. Like the woman who you spoke to, who's a member, like this is, these are her feelings and she's found an outlet for her political perspective. And that's, that's totally legitimate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but like the unbalanced nature of the coverage, you watch WCCO lately. Mm -hmm. And it's just Reg Chapman and story after story from one perspective and one perspective only. Reg Chapman is, was the first one to cover operation safety. Now that I found he's the earliest. 
that's exactly what I would have expected. <laughs> See, I was expecting <laughs> it to be Jay Coles and uh, what a. <laughs> I don't know, my my <laughs> ranking of conservative Minneapolis news, just based on this year of crime and safety politics, <laughs> I think Carol Levin does the best job. I think I'd rank Fox Fox Nine second, then KSDP, and WCCO is at the at the bottom. They are like the news outlet of Joe Tamburino and people very exercised about crime and not oh, yeah. very interested in I changes to uh, public safety in Minneapolis. Really glad I came on here tonight. I'm uh, learning a thing or two from you, John. <laughs> you, you don't watch. <laughs> you don't watch enough. Uh, enough local I tv news i stopped for a long time and now i'm subscribed to their youtube channels Ooh. and it's it's got me a little fra- afraid for the future because you could say maybe local tv news is dying but now they can deliver you individual stories two minute segments and if youtube knows that you love crime stories you will just get four crime stories in a row from the four different tv news channels on youtube and that can only be a good thing i'm sure yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine any negative consequences to that sort of. Just four four Reg Chapman stories in a row. Not yeah. let that mess with your head. I give the customer what they want. You know, that's really what Operation Safety Now seems to be about in terms of their messaging is, you know, just finding ways to reinforce these fears of, you know, the city bleeding and being teetering on the edge of disaster after the past year. And, you know, only Chief Arredondo and Jacob Fry can save us. And we can only accomplish that by giving more money to the police. Our Chief Arredondo. Support our our chief has been my least favorite political slogan in 2021. Oh my goodness. Because it's so empty. He's a nice guy. Have we talked about how weird it is? that the chief is engaging in politics. Who is, he's a department head. He shouldn't be doing politics like this. I'll editorialize. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's not an elected official. He, you know, is appointed obviously at, at the pleasure of the mayor. So he certainly has some interest in having a sympathetic figure as the mayor. Well, and, uh, and the fact that he's like, I feel like like there's a lot of stuff that like I have. Oh my god, I have so many theories. I got so paranoid working on this story. Actually, like it was a uh, ridiculous. I was driving to the gym once, and there's a cop car following me for like four blocks, and I started to freak out. And I was like, "Oh no, they're 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 a park officer, and they're just taking the same detour around River Road as me." I just need to chill, <laughs> chill out a little. <laughs> but uh, but one of the things I I am comfortable saying is that it struck me as very newsworthy that, as you said, Ardondo's appointed and here he is working to have an influence over the people who appoint him. You know, again, it yeah, feels yeah. like an inversion of the way things are meant to be. Right. I'm specifically talking about their endorsements of city council candidates. Right. So, Jason, did you want to talk about Alondra, Ward 9 Council member Alondra Cano? Yeah. Um, you know, I... Um, famously on Wedge Live, uh, used to live in Ward 9 uh, in Powderhorn Park. Um, I do. Okay, great. So we, you know, we have both had the experience of being um, familiar with Council Member Kano. Um, I, in full disclosure, I used to consider myself close with her. Um, some friends and I used to meet monthly to talk about city politics and things like that. And it wasn't uncommon for her to come and join us and, um, you know, have brunch and talk about different things going on in the city. Uh, I helped, I volunteered with her reelection campaign in 2017. Um, and, you know, I would say over the past four years, we've certainly drifted apart um, ideologically and reading about the things that you uncovered or, you know, put out into the open, I think are maybe the most damning of the findings that you you published in the article. Um, <laughs> you know, the 
yeah the way that eric Wan, um you know being part of the capital long range improvements committee um you know is referenced as being able to benefit alondra and the lake street latino business association um you know and and she is somebody who again speaking to a national news outlet in usa today last year you know made kind of a big deal about proclaiming herself an abolitionist to 6 months later you know voting to authorize a half a million dollars extra in funding for MPS without any sort of plan from the chief. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's a huge reversal of her position. Um, And you also mentioned, you know, that Alondra said that Juan and Rodriguez never met um, with the LSLBA. Um, However, in an email from November 20th, um, she was invited to a meeting between him and the LSLBA. Um, you know, there's just a and lot she, here to unpack. He is the economic development consultant for the LSLBA now. So I. Yeah. So as one of her constituents, like the, you know, what did you think when you started reading these emails that she was involved in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. I, you know, Patrick Kulikan is the editor over there, there at the Reformer, and when when I got this like packet of documents, I, like I wrote to him, and I'm like, I think this is a big deal, and um, he's very uh, grounded, and I'm I'm still a, a relatively new to uh, the journalism career, so I don't think he really believed me. Um, we were going through some of them, and there was like this detail where Rodriguez talked about like putting on a puppy parade as part of an effort to like lobby Andrew Johnson. It was pretty goofy. And he even notes in the email, I'm like, I'm joking, (laughs) but also we should look into something like this. I mean, and that was the headline that was going to be in the lead. That was the big point. And, and then I turned in the first draft that had all the stuff about Kano and it just got deleted. We never talked about it again. (laughs) Puppy parade parade seemed a lot less important. Um, (laughs) That's fair. Uh, when, I mean, that doesn't make me afraid though. A puppy parade that might that might calm tensions in Minneapolis. Uh, yes, yeah, sounds like yeah. violence and eruption. A puppy parade. Specifically, there was a. Oh, you'll love this. You'll like this. Actually, what it really was. I'm being a little flippant when I call it a puppy parade. There was an incident uh, in Johnson's ward where a car was stolen with two dogs in the back, and Rodriguez floated the idea: if you find it the police need to lead a parade to return the dogs oh. with Mayor Fry, Chief Arredondo, and uh, and Andrew Johnson. I must have read that email <laughs> because if it wasn't in the story, I read it somewhere because that's ringing a bell. Yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, is kind of, that's funny. It's funny. Um, but to, to your question about my reaction, you know, I I really, really firmly believe that, like, it doesn't matter what I believe when I'm doing journalism, like, like I, it, it didn't even occur to me to like, think about like how I would react as a constituent of Kano's. Um, I was just, I've, I've really only looked at this situation from the point of view of, I think there's an obvious implication to that and it doesn't prove anything. It's not definitive. Again, I'm really clearly not accusing anyone of anything, but there's a very clear implication to that timeline of events. You said it was six months before she made that vote, J- uh, Jason. Um, yeah, somewhere in that five, six month area. She was vocally advocating to abolish the police two weeks before that vote. Um, in, uh, was it Star Tribune, I think? I'm forgetting the details now. Um, but in fairness to her, Andrew Johnson, who is also supports defund and abolition also voted for that. That vote in particular was just about short-term funding. Um, I know I talked to Andrew Johnson. He said his thinking on the matter was that like, yeah, he wants to defund the police, but like the fact is none of those structures are in place. Crime is rising. We need to do something now. So I, I don't see that vote as being 
particularly damning. Um, it really is that later vote uh, to raise or to keep the the. Uh, we're starting to get into some of the the, the weird, uh, wonky BS here, but <laughs> basically it is the really cops important. that exist on paper, right? It's the yes. Except, they're not real cops, and we're not we're not getting to that number of cops anytime soon. But well, there's a big budget fight about whether we would keep them on paper for the time. Did being. you did you Jacob Fry released the plan to address gun violence? Uh, was that two weeks ago now at that right. Northside press conference? He he calls for explicitly in that raising the police staffing levels to 888 officers. Right. which is the maximum allowed, which is the number that was defended by Kano in that vote and, and right. others. Yeah. So hypothetical imaginary for now. Yeah. But it, it was it part was of a, a larger strategy. And it was amazing to me at the time. Like these, these cops aren't coming in 2021. This is a budget discussion about 2021. Why is the mayor threatening to veto this budget in which the city council has provided all this extra funding for alternative responses, non, non-police responses. It's got all the staffing that the mayor wanted, all the hiring and training that the mayor wanted for 21. The only thing he can quibble with is the on paper officers who won't exist. And you can go, come back and fund them this December if you want to. But to threaten to veto that budget over that just seemed like he wanted a fight for the sake of headlines, basically. And you, you <laughs> write about how that was one of the one of the suggestions coming from Bill Rodriguez was, hey, you can look strong by threatening to veto. And there's no proof that the mayor took that advice, but it is something that Rodriguez suggested. It, it did seem a little weird that the mayor did it. So it's interesting to know that someone was suggesting it to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like, um, <laughs> I was talking to a, to a, a journalist friend of mine, um, Hannah Jones, who used to write for city pages before they shut in They They told me that, uh, how'd they put it? I can't remember just something about how like journalism requires an extreme comfort with ambiguity and uncertainty. There's so much we don't know. And right. I don't know. There's, I try not to speculate too much. <laughs> Talking about ambiguity, where does Bill Rodriguez live? <laughs> Do we well, know? let me tell you his home address. Um, no, I, um, let's not dox Bill Rodriguez. But does he live in no. Minneapolis? He does not. He does not. He has repeatedly said he does. He uh, told Council Member Jeremy Schrader. I spoke to Council Member Schrader, um, who said that. Uh, quote, Bill Rodriguez was very clear that he was my constituent. Um, and when he signed up to speak at that public hearing on November 16th, he listed a South Minneapolis address. And he is frequently in all those media reports that we talked about, um, described as the leader of a group of Minneapolis residents. So, <laughs> okay, so speaking of ambiguity, the thing I don't get is Hmm. I'm I, I'm 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 just like checking to make sure I'm not doxing him when I say this. And I don't think I am, so I'm gonna I'm I'm comfortable saying this. But he lives literally two blocks outside of the Minneapolis border, uh, across that line into Richfield, like two blocks. There's there, there's no reason not to own that. You know, his his ex wife lives in Minneapolis. Um, mm-hmm. He's still deeply concerned about that. He lives just two blocks away and there's spillover and Minneapolis needs to be a good neighbor, even to the people who aren't. I mean, it makes perfect sense for somebody from Richfield to be involved in this debate and to care about it, especially when they have family living here. Um, But why not say that? (laughs) Right. You've also got him telling different stories about the the thing that inspired him to get involved with this, the home Mm -hmm. invasion. So in one version, he's a, at home in bed with his wife during a home invasion in another story, his ex-wife was burglarized and you found evidence 
no evidence of an actual burglary, just like a door left open and no burglary. Um, yeah, I got the, uh, the, the 911 call incident report. Uh, um, and there was a, there's not a, there's not a ton of details, but the bottom line is, uh, the two lines that really leap out at me is that the, uh, the officer on the scene found the door open. He's not sure why, um, which Bill Rodriguez said the door was pried open. Right. And he, and then the, the officer on the scene said, uh, that it appears to be a false alarm, no evidence of burglary. So I don't know what happened that night. I mean, maybe it was a scare, but Bill Rodriguez said somebody was going down the street trying to pry open everybody's doors. Like, and, and, you know, I checked out the MPD's crime map, uh, and there were no crimes at all that took place within at least two blocks. After that, I was like, that's enough for me Right. on that night. Yeah. So again, I mean. Yeah. And I, you know, that to your earlier point, talking about all of the, the failures of media in covering these stories, you know, these are the things that get reported sort of breathlessly, mm-hmm. um, you know, and are taken at face value. Um, and, you know, are stories that get thrown around and used potentially to raise a lot of money to impact upcoming votes on things like charter committee or charter amendments, um, council, city council elections, the mayoral election, and things like that. And if they're not being followed up on and nobody else is doing that basic research, it's really concerning and um also very dangerous to the the democracy in our city to just have you know people who are willing to make up stories to get people to vote a certain way being treated as their as though they're reputable sources the th- to to just take that thought process of yours one one step further even uncovering those lies, it lies a heavy word. Uh, let me, I try not to I mean, use that, but let's, I mean, the I'm two, the two things can't be true. He can't have been a home in bed with his wife during yeah, a home yeah. invasion and his ex wife, who is not he his wife. He is certainly publicly <laughs> said things of the story. that are demonstrably untrue. <laughs> Multiple versions of the story have proven to be untrue. But, but as you said, like it undercuts our democracy when like there's people who we just take this stuff at face value. That's there is a way, I believe, that their interests are served by like a deepening cynicism. If you don't have the numbers in a democracy, which maybe they do, maybe they don't, they're not acting like they do. But if you don't have the numbers in a democracy, then you want people to not vote. You want people to be cynical and to not trust the system. And that's one of the worries for me, even having reported this and uncovered this, is that I I really hope it doesn't make people cynical. I really hope it doesn't make people stop trusting their neighbors, you know, because again, there was this, this woman who was the member of Safety Now I spoke to and her her story is like, I didn't dig into it super deep. I didn't pull like crime records, but like, I have no reason to doubt it. And that is, as, uh, as he said, like, that's an important part of the conversation. And I think it's just really important to like, not, not let this stuff make you cynical to like, stay hopeful and to remind yourself about like what you deserve as like a citizen in a democracy. We deserve better than this. I'm wondering more about Bill Rodriguez. He has always struck me as just kind of an overzealous kind of doofus. Like he's obviously sharing too much in emails with the city. Like who are these people get into long email conversations with each other and then they like forward it to the city as part of a reply. And then you've got all their, their internal communications. <laughs> like he's ta- talking real big in these emails. I, I don't know. Chief Arredondo or the mayor should have said, Hey guys, Stop sending us so many emails. Call me once in a while. 
Yeah, uh, but but <laughs> what do we know? Do we know anything about Bill Rodriguez's motivations? Do we suspect that he's like a tool of some of business interests, or is he just a guy who's like super into crime? And uh, I don't know. What's Bill I, Rodriguez's story? So. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to get like too hung up on him personally, because um, I mean, I did cyber stock the guy for a couple of months. Uh, so I mean, he is uh, he is the leader along with Don Samuels, and there's there is the question of funding. I'm just wondering. Like, I don't face? personally suspect that there's. It's necessarily nefarious. I think he comes across to me as if he really believes this stuff. But what do I know? Who, you know, how would I, I make that assessment? Here's some facts. Um, I don't want to speculate, but here's some facts. Um, on June 6th, which was four days before his ex wife had that scare at her home, um, uh, he wrote on Facebook that critics of defund were ridiculous for claiming it would lead to chaos. And then he shared a link to a story about Camden, New Jersey, which is another city that did. And he's like, this is what it'll probably look like, which isn't, that's not like a ringing endorsement of it, but it also it's not, not really in line with a lot of, with what he's said and done publicly since then. Right. Um, so that's one fact. <laughs> and another fact is that he uh, is a public relations consultant. That's his job. And uh, a lot of what he was doing, those skills were definitely used. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, he got he got in a story in, in a Paris newspaper. Right. <laughs> He's clearly good at what he does. Um, and so was he paid for it? I don't know. Was he paid for this work directly? I don't know. Was he, does he have clients? Did he get clients because of this work? I don't know. Or as you said, does he actually believe it? Was that scare his wife went through? Like, did that really change his mind about things? Even if he did exaggerate it pretty drastically. Um, I don't know. And, you know, in a similar vein, I don't know if the, this counts as a defense of Alondra Cano, but uh, she kind of ping pongs from one position to another for no apparent reason. Like, in 2017, I think people were shocked when she endorsed Jacob Fry for mayor as the Black mm-hmm. Lives Matter candidate. So, yeah, I mean, she has <laughs> I she's she kind of that. like gone back and forth across the spectrum a couple of times. I think she just is kind of a flailing politician in that way. I, who's yeah. to say if you're lying or you just don't really have any positions and kind of yeah, ping, yeah, ping pong yeah, is, from one side to the other this is why i try to not be why i try to keep my journalism hat on because like when i step outside of that i start again like speculating and, and all this sort of stuff that you shouldn't do when you're a journalist so absolutely well, about that as as someone who is not a journalist i will engage in a, <laughs> well, come in on a little jason before this show started you you contacted fry and cano for a comment that's very journalistic of you i mean i i they chose not to comment, but also, you know, just because I have a few journalistic behaviors doesn't mean that I'm a journalist. Um, but I will say a couple things about Alondra going back to the fact that she and I have known each other for several years and I've had many interactions with her. Um, you know, I do think that she shows the propensity to change her mind depending on which way she's being pressured by various constituent groups. I know she got a lot of pressure from Lake Street businesses after last summer to um, increase police presence, and that's something that she's worked on. Um, I know that that is pressure that she has received you know, going back a long time. However, she's also somebody who self-describes as an activist, self-describes as an abolitionist. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to 
discuss those issues of you know community safety without police and that is something that she made a lot of headlines for supporting you know a year ago mm-hmm. um i will also Less say that again like- Oh, I I will also say that I've heard speculation that part of the reason that she is not running for re-election is that she's going to be looking to, you know, be the head of a nonprofit or an organization, maybe not the, um, you know, Lake Street Latino Small Business Association, but something like that. And, you know, using her position right now to sort of solidify some of those relations may be part of something that was just too good to pass up, you know? You're being a pundit right now, Jason. You're not, yeah. not, not your journalist hat. This is your pundit hat. No, that's, that's a good rumor. Anyways, that was, that was definitely a question I had. Um, another question I had that I didn't have a way to get an answer to is like, I wonder what she's going to do after she, uh, after she, is done on the council. So as we come to the as we come to the end here, getting back to the larger question of police politics and who who do we blame for the situation we're in right now? That's basically what we're engaging in. The mayor oh, it's saying probably hey. you, I think. I don't know why, but um, <laughs> I hear you've been like spreading all this defund rhetoric, which is emboldening criminals. Um, yeah, I mean. I mean, the mayor's budget defunded too. That's another thing that irritates me about the defund conversation. That you know what the mayor's budget, as he proposed it last year, did it defunded the police. There was less money in the budget for police in 2021 as the mayor wanted. Same with the council; they both defunded. So, as we as we debate whether defund is to blame, I guess Fry's a defunder too. But one of the one of the emails you uncovered is Steve Kramer talking about how solid the funding is for MPD in 2021. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're in the midst of this back and forth with the mayor blaming the council for not, I mean, the he can't point to anything specific, but the implication is he's been denied resources. Totally untrue. Hasn't been denied, I guess, resources maybe, but as far as personnel, he got everything he wanted. So it was interesting to read that from Steve Kramer, declaring victory, basically, after the budget fight in December, saying they got what they wanted. Mm-hmm. And yet here we are. Yeah, I mean, the the rhetoric that we hear from groups like Operation Safety Now is that simply by discussing the idea of defunding police were damaging the city and emboldening criminals and things like that, um, which obviously, you know, is nonsense. And when you look at crime rates in other cities that aren't having this discussion and see similar rises in crime, that yeah. clearly puts the lie to it. And also the fact that, you know, if that was truly the case, then wouldn't the mayor and these citizen groups speaking out so much in favor of the police um, be swinging the pendulum the other way too? Like, why, how can that influence only work one way? Yeah. Okay. I think we're going to let Logan plug his podcast now because he's also a podcaster. Did you know that, Jason? Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't know it from the technical difficulties that we've had, and we're not yeah. going to video of Logan, but he is yeah. audio he, only. He is a professional podcaster. Can oh. I call you a professional podcaster? Uh, well, we're about ready to do a. You know, we just finished like the first big raft of episodes, and we're getting ready to do a fundraising push. So not yet, but I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful. <laughs> okay, Pl- plug um, your fundraising effort. Let's make sure you take down all these fascists. Yeah. So I think it's a fairly uncontroversial um, statement that any sort of a line that separated mainstream conservatives from the far right um, has pretty much disappeared. Um, And 
that's not to say every conservative is an extremist, because I absolutely do not believe that. There's a lot of very conscientious conservative people. But it does then raise the question of like, how do you differentiate between your mainstream reasonable conservatives and the extremists? Um, you know, I really got into this because uh, I wrote a story about Roger Chamberlain following, uh, you know, Minnesota State Senator Roger Chamberlain engaging with neo-fascists on Twitter. Um, and it's like, oh, damn. I wish I understood what was happening a little bit better. Um, so we've had a few good episodes. We did one. I talked to a guy who was uh, deep in QAnon. I talked to him for like three hours uh, and really learned a lot. That was fun. Uh, it's the most like recent- talking to Jason. Talking <laughs> to Q. It's like, I'm stuck here with Jason for three hours. <laughs> you, you wish, can John. Him, can you tell him to work on my elevator pitch? Part of the fundraising prep is, is going to be like working on this sort of pitch. So don't have it down pat yet. But uh, yeah, we're just taking a look at the emerging American right, especially as it relates to Minnesota. Unbalanced.mn. You can follow us on Twitter at unbalanced underscore MN. There's uh, lots of links to the show there too. Um, and you can find us on Patreon if, if you've been so swayed by my performance here in this really tight elevator pitch I just gave. Uh, you can go to our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash unbalanced MN. And how many episodes are you into it? Can we listen now? Yeah, we got seven episodes, uh, six episodes out, and I'm I'm editing the seventh. Uh, it's uh, about Catholicism. Uh, you know, I talked to, there's a gentleman named Stanley Payne who's a, a history, or he's a pro, he's a, like a renowned scholar on the modern history of Spain. So I talked to him about the relationship between the Catholic church and the Franco regime. And then I paired that with uh, an interview with a woman named Heidi Schlumpf, who's the editor in chief of the uh, national Catholic reporter, which is a Catholic newspaper. And she has done a lot, a lot of work investigating the way extreme wealth has driven the Catholic church to the right in recent decades. So Hmm. that one's coming out in a couple of days. I'm excited about that one. Okay. Everyone go listen and support Logan's podcast. This yeah. world needs more podcasts. <laughs> yeah, I much. would say that the world needs more media addressing uh, the the rightward drift of a lot of media and institutions. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate the work that Logan is doing there. Well, thank you. And it was a wonderful story. I know. It's not easy. It's a lot of work. People think, oh, well, he just opened up this 900 page PDF and he found all these quotes and he slapped together a story. No, he had to he had to read through 900 pages to find this and string it into a narrative that makes any kind of sense. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Well, something I, I do want to point out, though, is that like I I'm only able to do this because of so many people like, you know, I think like the woman who watches our kid watches my kid like she's she owns way more of this story than she's ever going to get credit for. <laughs> but uh but yeah thanks for having me it's been it's been a real pleasure okay and thanks to logan carroll who wrote the story thanks to jason garcia who is co-host of this podcast and thanks to me john edwards i am uh i'm the anchor and managing editor of wedge live this is a real real thing real 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 thing <laughs> We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.